Pets are an important part of our lives. My dog Holly passed away two years ago, and I have missed her terribly. So to immortalize her, back in February, I took a pet portrait class with John of Art East Quilting Company. It was an excellent class, and we had to get up and close with our projects. So close that it triggered for me a new puppy coming into the family. I liked his style, his teaching method, and his quirky patterns so much. Not only did I sign up for another class, his kidding around workshop, I invited him on the show. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea, and here's my interview with John of Art East Quilt Company. Hi, John. Thank you for being on the show. Now, I understand you're in Halifax, but you are just about to move to another part of Nova Scotia. I am. Uh, we just bought a small fixer upper in Cape Breton, uh, close to the beach. Uh, so I'm very excited to move close to the ocean and uh, soak up all the inspiration that's going to come with that. So are you near any of the towns? Or are you really in the back of beyond in Cape Breton? I'm kind of between towns. We're in a, a small, we're going to be in a small mining town. Um, so a little bit of history there, but really small population, but we'll only be about 10 minutes from Sydney. So how did you end up in Nova Scotia? You're originally from my neck of the woods. Yeah, I'm from Windsor, Ontario. Uh, so I'm a theater kid. That's, uh, it's actually what led me to my quilting journey. We'll get there, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but I was in the theater program at the University of Windsor and fell in love with costume design and the university here in Halifax has a really great costume design program. So that's what actually brought me out east. So had you sewed before you started costuming? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was the only person in, uh, in my program that hadn't sewn before when I got there. So to say that there was a steep learning curve at first would be an underestimation. <laughs> yeah, I just can't think of you know, like in costuming, you use so much fabric and there's intricate construction and then you have to deconstruct it to make it easier for your, for people to get in and out of them. Yes. Yes. Actually, some of my, my friends from the program would all laugh at the first day, the instructor said, okay, everyone thread your needle. And I raised my hand. <laughs> um. <laughs> So were there any crafters in your family beforehand? My mom used to sew before my time. Uh, I think she used to make outfits for my older sisters, um, but she was always very crafty. So, you know, back in the seventies, she did all the macrame. Uh, I can remember when I was young, her doing all like the toll painting, things like that. Uh, my father was a woodworker, uh, not by trade, but for, for a hobby. So he used to make um, pieces of furniture, uh, shelving, things like that. Uh, so I was always kind of exposed to creativity growing up. I was always very encouraged in my family, which was nice. Uh, and then my oldest, uh, my older sisters were both crafty, but my oldest sister um, was actually, uh, was studying to be a drama teacher. So that's kind of what introduced me to the theater and made me fall in love with that at a young age. How did you pivot into quilting? Like costumes, quilting? So it's funny because um, you can imagine everybody assumes, oh, you must have quilters in the family, or your mom must have quilted, or your grandma must have quilted, uh, but they didn't. Um, when I started my program, I think I knew what quilts were. I knew that they were blankets, <laughs> um, which I cringe at now, but I don't know if I actually understood that they were quilts because they were quilted. Um, so it really wasn't until my uh, fashion history courses where we would see these really intricately um, quilted doublets or petticoats of the 18th century uh, that I really grasped what quilting was. And then of course, quilts made a lot more sense. Um, I also had this one class uh, that was called Costume and Technology, which was probably one of my favorite courses um, of the entire program where we would learn uh, just a little bit of everything um, to do with, with sewing and fabric, the, all these different techniques that we could potentially apply to costuming. Uh, and in that, um, we actually learned trapunto, both by machine um, and hand. So that was kind of my first, my first application of quilting myself. But it wasn't until much later um, where I had kind of moved away from the creative world altogether that I thought, you know what, I need to do something to get creative again. I thought, well, let's try making a quilt. 
and I've never looked back. <laughs> so what was your beginner mistake? Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I would say, so it's, it, uh, I bit off more than I can chew for my first quilt for sure. It was a star pattern quilt and it was, it ended up being about 80 by 80 inches um, for a first quilt, which is quite large. Um, you know, a lot of half square triangles, a lot of flying geese. Uh, my biggest mistake with my first quilt, I think, was not choosing the fabrics that I was going to be happy with. Um, at the time, I, I didn't know what resources I had available to me, not only in my city, but online. So I really kind of procured my fabrics from local chain stores, which will not be named, that don't always have the best selection or quality. Uh, so I, I, like many of us, I cringe at my first quilt, which I like to keep it as a reminder of where I started. <laughs> so what came first, your quilt patterns or your pet portraits? Uh, definitely the quilt patterns. Um, I, I had a couple of patterns designed by the time I did my first pet portrait. Uh, my first pattern was called Up and Atom, which was a repeated block pattern using half rectangle triangles. Uh, and I had actually kind of designed that one out of necessity um, to use to teach a in-person workshop. Do you remember those? <laughs> um, for quilters. So I had designed that one first um, and I released that pattern later on. Um, but then the first pattern that I actually released would have been my quilting is for the birds pattern. Uh, which depicts um, four birds, which is the blue jay, uh, the robin, the cardinal, and the goldfinch. Um, so that would have been my first pattern release. You have amazing pattern names. I love how your humor comes into it. <laughs> Thank uh, you. <laughs> is your goat pattern your most popular? If you would have asked me this a couple of months ago, I would have said yes. Um, but my wonderful woodland pattern has really uh, picked up and is probably my best-selling pattern now. Um, there's been a, uh, a specifically there's been one uh, American retailer, a big online retailer that picked it up and they go through quite a bit of those. But I love your take on those animal blocks like space Thank bacon. You. I think that's just <laughs> <laughs> my personal favorite is catrobics. <laughs> I don't know whether it's just because I grew up with Jane Fonda uh, in the background, but I see you've got mythical wieners behind you. Where does the humor come from? I've always been someone who tried to inject humor in everything that I do. Um, something like quilting for me. I mean, let's be honest, making a quilt is a commitment. Uh, so when I'm making a big project, I want to be smiling the whole time. So even if, you know, the techniques are hard, at least you have these little eyes staring back at you that you know are going to become these little goat babies in pajamas <laughs> eventually, you know, to keep you going. So that's where a lot of the humor comes in, I think, for me. Did you realize making those pet blocks would be challenging in the way that they are? There was a learning curve for me when I first started designing patterns, realizing that not everyone had my background. So, I found when I started to design patterns, I found it quite a natural um, transition for me because I was used to drafting patterns for clothing or for, for costume. So drafting or uh, drafting or designing the patterns for a quilt block in the two dimension over the three dimension seemed to be quite intuitive for me. Um, so I kind of had a learning curve of understanding other people's skill sets who are going to want to tackle these patterns um, and had to kind of revisit those first patterns and, you know, look at them a little bit differently and say, okay, I'm going to present it this way instead to make it a little bit more uh, accessible for, for an everyday quilter. So when did you do your first pet portrait? So yeah, my first pet portrait, um, it came pretty early on. Uh, I, like I said, I had a couple of a portrait un portraits under my belt. Uh, I remember seeing this really great um, pop art uh, French bulldog <laughs> pattern on the cover of Quilty magazine at one point. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. Um, we had a lot of dachshunds in the family. This was even before ours came to join us. Uh, and I thought, oh, it'd be cool if I did, you know, a dachshund like this, let's give it a try. Um, I had been familiar with raw edge applique at that time, just from some costuming techniques. Um, so that was kind of easy for me, uh, but bringing it together and making that first portrait was kind of this multicolored 
dachshund face. <laughs> uh, and that's kind of where it started. And I didn't really expect it to take off until I started getting messages from people who had seen them and said, you know, my mom just uh, loves her dog. I would love to get her one of these portraits for Mother's Day or for a birthday. And then the orders started coming in. Um, and after that, first year and a half, I had over 75 pet portraits under my belt. Um, so I was, I was quite busy with those. For me, when I took your pet portrait class, what made the difference and actually what got me all emotional was the degree that we looked at the shape and structure of the dog. You know, you got so up close and personal with the photo. Was it that way right from the beginning? Did you understand that that was going to be the difference between a good portrait and a bad portrait? Yes and no. Um, it depends on the style of portrait. Uh, so I have done portraits in many different styles. There's a difference when someone asked me to do a portrait um, you know, for a dog that's still living. But then when someone comes and says, listen, my friend, or we just lost a pet, we really want to get this portrait done. I know the emotion that's that's coming along with that. So it puts a little bit extra pressure on that portrait to really capture the animal, right? Um, so I would say that there is a difference of, you know, what pet you're doing and, and how you kind of tackle that, um, that portrayal. Uh, but getting up close and personal with the pet is something I usually always do. Uh, for the portrait, I always look at a, a photo and I think, okay, now what makes this pet unique? Um, what's unique about this pet? And I usually try to either exaggerate or focus on that in my portrait. Now you've expanded it into a class. You also take commissions. You've got a couple of quilt patterns too, I think. Or was it just a result of one? You have that beautiful pattern where the, the, the wiener head is in the pillow <laughs> and the tail is in the quilt? Yeah, at the opposite way. The, the head the opposite the way, sorry. The <laughs> but I mean, just keeping track, right? They're so long. Uh, yeah, no, that wasn't, that wasn't a quilt um, pattern. That was just a, a portrait for someone who had commissioned a quilt. Um, that particular uh, client had, had asked, you know, I would love to get a pillow and a quilt done of the dog's face. And I thought, well, you're gonna have two of the same dog, you know, why don't we have fun with this and put their back end on the pillow? So that's where that, uh, that's where that was born. That's actually one of my favorite portraits um, to date. I really love that one. And the colors that you used were fantastic. Thank you. You started off doing a block of the month program. Is it a block of the month or do you call it a quilt along? So I call it the mystery quilt block of the month. So along. <laughs> It's not, the title's not quite long enough, <laughs> but I, I feel I needed all those words to really get across uh, what it is. So How many years have you been doing it now? So um, we're going to be starting our third annual, um, so long for short, <laughs> in <laughs> September. So you've done, was Wood, Woodland Animals one of them? Yeah, so the first one was Wonderful Woodland. So that was kind of nine blocks. So it goes over nine months. Um, and that was the first one. Uh, the second one was the deep dive quilt, which just finished in May, uh, was also nine blocks. And now we have the hashtag trending quilt, uh, which will be starting in September, which will also feature nine blocks. Uh, the first of which is our little sloth friend you can see hanging around my social media. And I, I've signed up for that one. And I actually bought the kit from you. You got me on a day when I just didn't want to have any brain space taken up with choosing <laughs> fabric. And I just said, you know what? I'm buying the kit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I try to make the kit really easy for people. Um, so, you know, I, I, I pre-cut all the fabric into blocks so you don't have to worry about using too much fabric in one block. Um, you know, I provide you with little labels with the letters on them so that when you cut, you can keep track of your pieces so you don't even have to think about that. That was smart. That was smart. <laughs> I, I saw that. I thought that you've done, it, you've done a really good job of organizing it. I, the funny thing about the sloth is I, I always think of Kristen Bell. Have you seen the little mem where she just gets so emotional that? Oh, seen it. I have probably watched that video of her on Ellen a hundred times. And I laugh every time because she's so invested <laughs> in her love for sloth. So I'm thinking maybe I'll just turn the first one into a pillow and send it off to her. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be her good place. But I'll be interested to see which, what other ones are in the, uh, in the mix. It's going to be hard to top the sloth. Oh, well, thanks. I hope I'm, I'm really excited about this quilt. It's probably my favorite sew along quilt um, that I've de designed so far. Um, as a quilt designer, 
you kind of try to stay away from things that have either been overdone or have been tackled on by, especially when there's a lot of famous quilt designers who maybe have done patterns. Um, but I kind of used this so along as an excuse to put my own spin on those popular animals and those popular creatures that we've seen everywhere, you know, on lunch bags, on backpacks, on pillows um, over the past few years that have maybe been done before, but having them all in one place is just kind of glorious. So I'm really excited for everyone to see what's in store. This is my goat. <laughs> Oh, it's great. <laughs> and I laugh because it looks like Mando. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I've channeled dogs. my dog, my new when dog. We're my <laughs> when we're obsessed with our animals, we see our animals in everything. <laughs> and I had an interesting time quilting it because you, I think, oh, I'm just going to do straight lines. But then I actually got a little ah. more invested into the, the, the scruff. What do they call that on a goat? Beard? Uh, a goatee. A goatee. Well, uh, I, I, I just saw that <laughs> light bulb turn on. <laughs> no, I really enjoyed making that. That was a good class. I'm glad. Thank you. So have you got any more online classes? So I'm going to be posting a fall schedule of classes in mid-August. Um, so keep your eye out on my social media and uh, our newsletters for that. There will be more pet portrait classes, don't worry, but I will be bringing in some other, um, some other classes as well. Uh, one that I'll give you a, a little sneak at is that I'm gonna be doing a traditional class of cathedral window um, quilts, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually one of the first quilting techniques uh, that I tackled because I just thought they were so beautiful. Just start at the top. Like why, <laughs> why, why start not? with those beginner skills? Just yeah, start why? at the top. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I'm, I'm excited to make that accessible to people who might be intimidated, uh, intimidated by them. So has your favorite color changed since you've become a quilter? But when I started quilting, I was definitely into the blues and the teals and I still am. I love them. It's my mom's favorite color. So I think of her every time I see them. Um, but I also like kind of these muted colors together. Um, one of my uh, quilt samples that's going to be coming out for the fall, which I'm working on, is this really fun pattern, but with kind of a little bit more of a sophisticated palette. Um, so I, I really like those, you know, those colors where you see that that kind of gray undertone coming through. I'm really drawn to that right now. So I'm, I'm excited to show that. Uh, I also like to, a lot of times, um, because my patterns uh, a lot of my patterns are so fun and joyous and quirky. Uh, sometimes I like to bring in a little bit more of a sophisticated palette to them, um, kind of to make them a little bit more accessible as well um, to a wider audience. Uh, so I, I tend to gravitate towards those, those muted palettes. And what is your favorite quilt that you've made so far? My favorite quilt? That is a good question. I have quite a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's like choosing your favorite child, isn't it? I know. How do you do it? Um, I think, I know this is a little cliche because I'm talking about the sew along, but some of my favorite blocks are in the sew along that's coming up. So I had a lot of fun <laughs> making that one. Um, but a quilt that you can go check out now, I think um, the goats in pajamas, I think is going to be a favorite of mine for a while. Uh, it was kind of my first pattern where I really took a quirky turn with things. Um, and I just like the feeling of accomplishment after making that one because it's, it's probably my most difficult pattern as well. Um, so that's probably, that's probably my favorite quilt that I've made so far. And do you label your quilts? I don't not because I don't believe in it because I just don't have the time <laughs> I really should however thank goodness um I kind of have a very strong social media log where I could go back and kind of date things if I needed to yeah that's something I probably should do and you probably hear this a lot that I don't do it <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the same way like but by, by the time I put the binding on like I'm done oh like, yeah to have that. another step after that is like <laughs> no I'm done like yeah. I, I can barely get around to taking off the threads I have quilts from years ago I say it like I've been quilting forever I haven't <laughs> some of my first quilts still have threads hanging off them in the back <laughs> so that's actually what I'm doing this year I'm on a journey to figure out how to label them because I've received a quilt last year Last year, my friends and I 
um, we all combined our efforts and made one quilt for each person in the in the in the group. Oh, cool. And one of them was your kidding around that went to Joanne, but we all made a label and signed it. So as I'm surrounded in love by this quilt, I've got this label on it with all my friend's signature on it and to remind us of what we were doing during COVID, yeah. you know, and I realized that's what a label's for. It's not about saying, look at the quilt I made. It's to remind the person who has it why and when and by whom. Yes. Um, I think if, if I were gifting my quilt, I would probably put a label on it. Um, much to my family's chagrin, I haven't really gifted many quilts. <laughs> I'm a little bit of a hoarder of my quilts. I'm sure I'll, I'll have too many eventually that I'll start, you know, handing them out. But <laughs> the same with me, I've been very, very particular about not giving a quilt to a person who doesn't want it. Like I'm not giving a quilt to somebody just because to give them a quilt. I'm, exactly. I'm giving a quilt to them that they want. And sometimes it takes a little time to get that together. Yes, they need to want it as much as you want to give it to them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So are you a member of a guild? I am not. Uh, I'm, I'm not. I've just, you know, what? I'm kind of a loner. <laughs> um, I'm kind of an introvert, believe it or not. Um, and I, I, I never really... Uh, got into the guild. I know, I know quite a few members and I probably definitely would enjoy it. Now that I'm moving, I'll probably be looking to meet some more people. So maybe that's something I'll, I'll look into while I'm in Cape Breton. Um, but uh, I definitely follow a ton of guilds and I'm always amazed at, you know, what they do together. Um, I love talking to guilds. Um, maybe one day, if anyone wants me. <laughs> well, you've, got, you've got such a vibrant, I, I mean, Coming from Ontario, I, I put all the maritime provinces in sort of one group, but there's some really wonderful um, guilds in the Maritimes. PI has several, like I cannot believe PI has, I think, five. They probably have more guilds than grocery stores. <laughs> <laughs> so have you found that you have a select group of tools that you like to use, or you just like to go into a cupboard and grab whatever you think can be used for the job. You know what? I grow attached to my tools, <laughs> like more than I probably think I do. Like my cutting mat right now that I've had since the beginning, you could probably rip it apart. <laughs> it's so used. It's time to replace it, but I, I, I just keep holding on. Same thing with my, my big six and a half inch by 24 inch ruler. There's chips out the sides from dropping it and, and I just can't let go. <laughs> um, but uh, aside from that, I'm, I'm pretty mainstream when it comes to the, to the tools that I use. Um, I don't use any tools that are really outside of the box that I can think of, um, but, uh, but I, I do become, I become close to them. <laughs> so I know we've been in COVID for a little while, though in your neck of the woods, you haven't had a lot of it. Have you been able to do much traveling for quilting? No, no, not at all. Um, I think because... Well, I think the reason we haven't had a lot of it out here um, was because we were locked down pretty quickly and pretty, dil pretty diligently. Um, I mean, thank goodness. Uh, so I, I haven't been able to do much traveling at all, um, quilting or other related. Uh, I haven't seen my family in over oh, almost two years now. Yeah. So I'm, I'm excited for things to open up to go visit them. Um, but, uh, you know, things are looking up. I hope, you know, starting, everyone's starting to get double vaccinated and, you know, PEI just passed that you don't need to wear masks inside now if you're double vaccinated. So hopefully that's a good sign and we can keep the variants at bay. Um, having said that, what COVID brought that I wasn't expecting was an expansion to the sewing community and to the quilting community that I, that floored me. Um, I remember right as we first locked down was right before I was going to release uh, my spring patterns for 2020. And I remember thinking, oh, maybe I should wait and hold off these two weeks that we're gonna be locked down. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and yeah, I kind of put a poll out there on Instagram and say, should I wait or should I release it? And uh, everyone was like, no, release them, release them. Everyone's looking for something new to do. And they were right. Uh, you know, my following doubled over COVID. Um, my reach of my patterns, you know, 
just went up exponentially. You know, I got picked up by a couple of American distributors, one that distributes worldwide. Um, so while COVID was a terrible, terrible thing for, for business, the business side of it, as someone who's in the quilt business, um, it really expanded things. Uh, and it also created more of a global community, you know, than what we had before, I, I find, you know, moving to virtual classes allowed me to be teaching people, you know, in Australia and in California all at the same time from Nova Scotia. I mean, yeah. how wonderful is that? That I'm sure there were, there were virtual classes before, but it, it blows my mind uh, how, you know, we were able to bring people together from all over the place, even in ways that, you know, a guild is very localized and a, a guild couldn't. So um, I think while COVID was definitely terrible, you know, I'm always the kind of person, you know, look at the bright side of things. And it kind of gave us this gift of making our global quilt community a little, a little more tight knit. Um, and I think it's going to be changed forever because of it. I agree. I find even though I was very active online before, there was still this sense of distance in the world. And I don't have that anymore. I have a regular chat with a friend in Australia. I having Zoom meetings with friends in the UK and we deal with the time difference, but you just feel like they're in the next room. So strange to realize like the Australian gnome angel, she's the next day. Yes. <laughs> I'm talking to her is actually the next day for in the future <laughs> but her day's starting and my day's ending but it really has and I, I find that even in our guild I belong to the Toronto Modern Guild that there's people from all over the world that have have joined and I could do the same if I had more time on my hands I could join other guilds all over the world and it's fascinating because there's just I mean, there's so many wonderful people in this community, isn't there? Oh my gosh, it's amazing. And I think quilters as a species, <laughs> um, I think we're all a little bit introverted in our, in our own way, mm -hmm. but being with other quilters and, and having that language that we share without even using words, just by showing our work, um, I think is is quite amazing. You know, I'm I'm all for expanding this this virtual offering of workshops. Again, back to your costuming background, have you brought in any of those wonderful fabrics that you used in costuming? Like, do you sew with anything other than cotton? Sometimes, um, especially if I'm doing like collage works, um, I, I do like to use. Um, I've actually de-stashed recently because I'm moving. So I got rid of a lot of old of my, some of my old costumes. I almost pressed the buy button. Like <laughs> I was just like sitting on my hands. I like, no, no, wait an hour. If it's still there, maybe you can buy it. <laughs> <laughs> but actually I have, um, I think there's some of them in here. So for example, this is my, my portrait of Dandy who you, you may meet or have met. Uh, but if I look in here, there's definitely some little pieces of some old costuming fabrics in here um, that I can see some silk, some silk cotton blends. Um, I'm actually going to be embarking on a little bit of a personal project, I think starting in the fall where I want to explore some of the um, historical garments that incorporated quilting. Uh, and, and kind of recreate maybe a piece um, specifically from the 18th century. I have kind of had my feelers out there for doing that, something for a personal project. So stay tuned on that. You might see some of that uh, reintroduced. Just want you to know that I name dropped you to Kathy Hay. <gasps> my interview that I just did right before. <laughs> I oh my gosh. <laughs> I love Kathy Hay. Oh my gosh. I, oh, she's heard my name. <laughs> what an energy that just draws me in. And calms me down. If I can't sleep at night, I put, you know, my historical costuming buddies on. I call them buddies. I don't know any of them personally, but you know, there's just, there's something about them that just slows, slows me down and just brings me back. Um, and, and that's really how I've been living vicariously through costume YouTubers uh, to keep my love of historical costuming alive. So I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to see um, Kathy's peacock dress project come together. Yeah. It's in incredible what she's doing and also doing it with um, a new eye and 
and social um, consciousness yeah. to it as well uh, of what, you know, the, the historical costuming um, community, or, or I should say just, I should say fashion, historical fashion in general has a very convoluted, complicated history as everything does. And she's addressing it in a very, um, I think very nice, accessible way without sugarcoating anything. And I think that's important. I've talked about this with these historical things. You know, we all love those Regency dresses and those parties and all those, but you got to take a second and figure out where was all that money coming from? Uh, not just the money, but the fabrics. Where were the fabrics coming from? Uh, you know, when you see the rise of cotton in the 19th century, that cotton was being exported from the Americas and we know where and how that's produced. And that's, that's a very real and sobering, sobering thing. Do you consider yourself a modern or a traditional quilter? I would definitely consider myself a modern quilter with um, an appreciation for traditional quilt um, patterns and, and quilting techniques, um, a cathedral window <laughs> quilting. Um, you'll see in a pattern coming out in September, it's a, it's a little bit more on the traditional side of the modern side of things for me. And uh, you'll, you'll definitely see, see that uh, coming out. I'm going to be making seven samples for my three quilts that are coming out um, in the fall. So I'll, I'll try to catalog those moments <laughs> of the making and share them with you all. Um, but one of them that I have coming out that I think uh, will be special for some people, I'm calling the reconnection quilt. Um, and I've kind of designed it in a way where you can have separate blocks um, or you can turn those blocks into disappearing blocks by connecting them. And it's kind of uh, a little bit of a nod to the fact that as a world, we're coming back together and we're reconnecting. So I'm really excited uh, to see what people are going to do with that pattern. Oh, that sounds wonderful. That sounds like a good project for stitch and chat groups and who haven't been able to connect. For sure. I like yeah. that idea. You know, actually, it would be a great pattern to, um, you know, if, if people who can't connect or our new friends from around the world can make blocks and send them all to one place to yeah. bring together. So what is your favorite part of quilting? For me, the favorite part of quilting is when I design a pattern and I see it come to life in fabric for the first time. There is nothing like that. It's like giving birth. <laughs> Not that I know what that's like either, but that's probably the closest thing I'll have. And it's wonderful. Um, no, be, I mean, being able to see something that started here and come out here and then seeing other people making it. I mean, that's just, that's the cherry on the cake um, is when you see people posting their quilts that they've made with my patterns. Uh, it doesn't get better than that. Yeah, that's pretty special, especially when they're, when they're done by somebody around the world, like something that you have zero connection to. Or by Angela Walters, I've had <laughs> recently. <laughs> I was looking at um, quilting is my therapy uh, Instagram account and she's quilting and I'm like, wow, that looks a lot like my <laughs> spill quilt pattern. And I looked at it and sure enough, it was my spill quilt. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> she's another lovely, lovely quilter. Angela Walters was, she was my gateway quilter. I think when I first started um, toying with the idea of making my first quilt, I found her and the Midnight Quilt Show and I would binge them. And I would, I, I fell asleep to her probably for six months straight. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's wonderful. And um, again, makes everything so accessible. And I mean, the work she does, stunning. Her and Tula Pink, when they collaborate on a quilt together is magic. Thank you so much, John, for being on the show. So if they want to join your quilt along, how do they contact you? Visit my website, www.artistquiltingco.com, all one word, uh, or find me on Instagram at artistquiltingco. Uh, I'd love to hear from you all. I can't wait to meet you. And, you know, this, this year, something new that I'm bringing to the sew along are the live sew sessions every month, which I never did before. So you'll actually get the opportunity to sew along with me um, and watch me make that month's block. Uh, so I'm really excited to kind of build the community further. Well, that's exciting. I can't yeah. wait. Thank you so much for being on the show. I hope one day either you get back home and 
I'll see you as you travel through Toronto, maybe, or I get out to the Maritimes. I would love <laughs> that. Let me know when you come out and, you know, I'll, I'll show you a, a Maritime good time. <laughs>I hope you've enjoyed my interview with John. If you are interested in any of his patterns or joining his new mystery quilt along, I'll leave a link in the notes below, as well as his social media and contact info. Next up on Karen's Quilt Circle is Emma Jones of the Vintage Sewing Box blog and YouTube channel. I think her vibe might be the polar opposite of mine, so it will be interesting to see where we overlap. Be sure to have Karen's Quilt Circle playing in the background the next time you're in your sewing room. I have interviewed so many amazing people. Let one inspire you. And I just finished my On The Go series, Sewing On The Go and What's In My Travel Bag. If you haven't seen it, just click on the link in the notes below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell beside the subscribe button so that YouTube will notify you when I make new videos. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. And of course, my website, JustGetItDoneQuilts.com. So take care and I'll see you next time.